Good morning, Captain. Hello, fellas. I understand you're ready to be checked out on the P-39. I see you've been reading over your pre-flight dope. That's the right idea. It's very important to have the technical orders covering the operation and first echelon maintenance well in mind before you take the plane off the ground for the first time. It should be thoroughly covered. Then, too, you should spend enough time in the cockpit to be certain you fully understand the instructions in the TO manual. In reading this material, you've probably learned a lot about the P-39. As you can see, it's a low-wing monoplane of the Interceptor Pursuit class, and it's designed to pack quite a wallop. It's equipped with a tricycle landing gear, which is retractable, but just forget that there are three wheels instead of two. It handles much like any other plane. The Allison liquid-cooled engine is behind the pilot, and a drive shaft runs forward to a reduction gearbox, which drives the constant speed propeller. This arrangement makes possible the installation of a high-caliber automatic cannon along the thrust line. Some models have a 20-millimeter cannon, and others a 37-millimeter. In addition, there are two synchronized 50-caliber guns in the nose, and two 30-caliber guns in each wing panel. You have enough armament here to take care of yourself, and to make it uncomfortable for the enemy as well. The guns are charged from the cabin and are fired electrically. There is a gun selection panel in the cockpit where you can switch on any or all of the guns. On the stick, there's a trigger for the 30s and 50s and a separate button for the cannon. carries, the rate of climb is exceptional. Its critical altitude varies in the different models between 13,000 and about 17,500 feet. Absolute ceiling is from 32 to about 35,000 feet. The engine in the different models varies from 1,150 horsepower at sea level upward according to the rating of the particular engine. Cruising at 2,300 RPM and 30 inches of manifold pressure at an altitude of 5,000 feet gives approximately 250 miles per hour indicated airspeed. Stalling speed is about 95 miles an hour indicated, fully loaded and with the flaps down. She handles very well and responds nicely to the control. detailed information you have from your reading and the thorough check of the cockpit, then you'll be ready to check out. Have any of you finished yet? Yes, sir. All right, Lieutenant, let's get started. Coming up on the wing, here's your hand grip, and be sure you don't step on the wing fillet. your parachutes, Lieutenant. Buckles properly attached, and the straps fit well. I guess you know that it pays to have your parachute right. Okay, climb in.
Compact little office, isn't it? You'll find everything you need here, and all conveniently located. First, have a look at the rudder pedals to see if they're properly adjusted for you. Down on the side of the pedal, there's an adjustment with five positions. Press the lever with your toe and set the pedal to the length that's comfortable for you. And do the same on the other side, but be sure both pedals are set to the same position. You might look back at the rudder as a further check on this. And at the same time, try your controls to be sure of their operating sense. Check the rudder, the elevators, and your ailerons, too. your brakes. First, hold out the brake handle. There above the radio panel. Then press in on your brake pedal. Then release the handle. Now let's fasten your shoulder straps. This harness is for your safety and it should be worn at all times. In the event of an emergency landing, it will prevent you from being thrown forward. The adjustable straps fasten to the seat belt buckle. Slide them on the catch, and the seat belt hook will hold them in place. The release fastens securely, and it can be opened in a jiffy, releasing both the shoulder straps and the seat belt. Down on your left is a knob which controls the shoulder harness lock. Pull it up, and it releases the harness so that you can reach forward. Reset it, and it locks the harness again. Top latch up here on each door. Keep it from being sucked outward at high speed. Be sure they're both fastened securely before you take off. And be sure the door handle is in the closed position, that is, horizontal. And down here on either side, there's an emergency release for the doors. If you ever have to, pull that out, and the entire door will fall away. Let's give it a try. You don't have to undo the top latch to release the door, but you may have to nudge it with your elbow to jar it loose at low speed. Both doors work in the same way. Here, let's plug in your radio connection. Just behind your right shoulder are the jacks for your throat mic and headset. Be sure they are securely fastened. your right is the transmitter. You can send either CW or voice, and there's a selection switch for the four bands. When you want to transmit, press the button on the throttle. Down in front of you are the receiver controls. There are three of them for ground, interplane, or beam reception. On your right is a hand crank for manual operation of the landing gear should the electric drive fail. To use it, first turn the clutch selector rod to the manual position, that is, pointing aft. There's a ratchet fall on the crank for up and down operation. Normally, however, the gear is operated by means of the electric motor drive, and the clutch handle should be in this position. The switches for all the electrical equipment are on the left side of the instrument panel. Be sure the landing gear switch is not in the up position. Check the gun switches to be sure they're all off before turning on the main battery switch. It's on the right side of the switch panel, and the generator switch is just below it. You might try your flaps to be sure they're working properly. The first of the three travel indicators is for your flaps. The other two are landing gear. Aside from being used in landing, the flaps can also be used to shorten your takeoff run on a small field. For this, one quarter flap should be used. However, I don't recommend that you use flaps for takeoff until you're more familiar with the plane. 
The propeller on this plane is an aero product propeller, which operates automatically. It changes pitch hydraulically by means of a cylinder in the propeller hub, and the only control is on the throttle quadrant. Some P-39s are equipped with Curtis Electric propellers. For these, there is a governor control on the throttle quadrant, similar to the other. In addition, there's a safety switch and a switch for automatic control. If automatic operation fails, there are manual increase and decrease positions on this switch. When you turned on the battery, it energized the fuel transmitter. Remember always to check the fuel in your tank. Down on your left is a fuel selector valve, which makes it possible to draw fuel from four lines, three actual tanks. For takeoff and landing, always use the reserve tank, which is part of the left wing tank. In actual operation, the fuel is pumped from the tank to the selector valve, through which the fuel lines from all tanks pass. From the selector valve, the fuel flows to the strainer where all foreign matter is filtered out. Then to the electrically driven booster pump, which replaces the old type wobble pump. It is used to pump fuel to the carburetor for starting the engine at high altitudes to prevent vapor lock in event that proper fuel pressure cannot be maintained, or it can be used in case the engine driven fuel pump fails. The fuel then goes to the engine-driven pump, which normally supplies sufficient pressure when the engine is in operation. From the fuel pump, the fuel continues on into the carburetor. In some models, there is a vapor eliminator system included here, and it is designed to overcome vapor lock. A red warning light on the instrument panel lights up when there is a drop in the fuel pressure, such as is caused when the tank empties. There is a small tank unit in the system which can supply enough fuel to keep the engine going for 90 seconds until you have had time enough to change to another tank. There is also a vapor return line through which vapor and excess raw gas from the carburetor flow back to the left tank at an appreciable rate. The reserve tank is really part of the left wing tank. Here there are two finger screens at the head of the two fuel lines which flow from the tank. The tall finger screen is for the left wing tank, and through this line you can draw the 40 gallons which are above the standpipe. Below this, the remaining 20 gallons or a full tank of 60 gallons can be drawn through the lower finger screen, which is the reserve tank. For long distance flying, these planes can be equipped with a belly tank varying in the fuel capacity from 75 gallons upward. The tank is attached to the underside of the fuselage by means of sway braces, and it can be released during flight by pulling out on the bomb release handle in the cabin. With the fuel selector valve in the auxiliary tank position, fuel from this tank is drawn up into the selector valve and then through the same system that the fuel from the other tank follows to the carburetor. When you change your selector valve to the right wing tank, you can draw 60 gallons. Just as in the other tanks, the fuel from here goes first through the selector valve and then through the rest of the system in the same way as did the others. Back of the trim tab controls is a carburetor heat control, which you will seldom have need for. Under extreme icing conditions, press the button to pull it out and it will bring warm air from the engine compartment to the carburetor. Well, now you've read all your pre-flight material and spent enough time in the cockpit to thoroughly familiarize yourself with all the controls and adjustments. Let's assume that you're taking her up for the first time. First, you'd set your fuel selector valve to the reserve tank, where with full tank you have 60 gallons. Then on the throttle quadrant, be sure the mixture control is an idle cutoff. The prop governor is placed full forward to low pitch or high RPM, and the throttle is cracked open about three quarters of an inch. 
On the side of the quadrant is a tension adjustment. Be sure you have a firm seal to all three of your controls to prevent them from creeping. Turn on the battery and generator. Then, to prime the engine, first crack the primer. Turn on the booster pump. Then pull out the primer so that it's filled. Turn off the pump and then push the primer in, locking it. In colder weather, you may have to do this two or three times. Then turn the ignition to bolt on. The inertia starter pedal is down on the right side. Press it back to energize. During the energizing operation, turn on the booster pump, which will bring your fuel pressure to about 13 and a half pounds. When sufficiently energized, check to see that your prop is clear before pressing forward to engage. <laughs> 